I'm Indy Nidell, and this is part two of our special on the armor used in North Africa around the time of Operation Torch. As you may have guessed, Chieftain is handling things here once again. In part one, he looked at the armored vehicles of Italy and Germany, and he will now look at Britain and America with a little bit on the French, just as a special bonus. All right, I'll see you at the end. Take it away, Chieftain. Now, let us move to the UK and discover what new toys they had received. Finally, the old pre-war inventory started to be replaced. Marm and Harrington armoured cars began to be fielded in significant numbers. With about two centimetres of armour, these were based on American trucks. At about six and a half tonnes, they were generally Mark II and Mark III with four-wheel drive. Uh, they were pretty popular. The only problem was that they were considered a little bit underarmed, with only vigorous machine guns, and thus it was not unusual to find vehicles that captured Italian 20mm or German 37mm guns mounted. Late November 1941, a new breed of tank arrived to replace the older Matilda IIs and cruisers. The new infantry tank was Valentine, mainly Marks II, IV, and III, but as an example of the speed of development, they would remain in frontline service not much more than a year. The tank initially met with a mixed reception. Smaller than Matilda II, difficult though that would have been, the tank also had a little bit less armour, about 65mm. Had the same two pounder gun, now getting a little bit anemic with no useful HE shell issued. Marks II and IV had a two man turret, adding to the commander's troubles. The Mark III arrived with a larger turret with room for a third man. On the plus side, it was discovered that the tanks were almost bulletproof in their reliability, and though limited in speed to about the same 15 miles an hour as Matilda II, in practice they had sufficient power reserves that they didn't slow down for curves or obstacles much. They were, in effect, far faster than the tanks that they replaced. And indeed, were considered in practice to be about as mobile as the cruisers, and thus being used as one on occasion, though this may also be a factor of cruiser drivers being a little bit timid in the hopes that they didn't break their tanks. By 2nd El Alamein in October 42, the vehicles were going out of frontline service with only one brigade retaining them. By early 43, a very few Mark 9s had arrived. These replaced the 2-pounder with a far better 6-pounder. Not only was it an excellent anti-tank gun, it also had a high explosive shell. Which is fortunate, because the gun was so big that it displaced not only the 3rd turret crewman, but also the coaxial machine gun, which kind of limited the ability of the tank. Such was to be the case for the new cruiser as well, Crusader. The first Mark I's arrived for combat in Operation Battleaxe, June 42. These shiny examples of British industry came with a good three-man turret, the ubiquitous and now marginal two-pounder gun, which field reports concluded were useful at this point against Mark III's only at 500 yards or less, enough armour that those same field reports said that they were losing Crusaders to 5cm fire at 1000 yards, and a little auxiliary turret in front left for some poor schmuck to sit in with a machine gun. The Mark II deleted that position in favour of stowage. To also help with the stowage problem, the British developed the utterly useless rotor trailer. I do recommend you look that up if you are unfamiliar with the genius of the design. The Mark III, which started showing up by November of 42, exchanged the fourth crewman for a six pounder gun, but unlike Valentine, could keep the machine gun. The tank was small and fast as long as it ran. One unit reported that if a crusader ran for 36 hours without some strange and terrible trouble, it was a miracle. The tanks quickly developed a reputation for horrid reliability and burning when hit. Many of the reliability problems began to get sorted out by the end of the desert campaign, and the tanks started to be used as a scout. It was not unusual for a British regiment to lead with crusaders in one squadron, using their speed and small size to pave the way for the big American mediums in the other two squadrons. Top speed at 27 miles an hour wasn't too far off anything else, but the Chrissy suspension did provide the faster, smoother ride in payment for its various liabilities. Crusaders also tended to bog a little bit less. As an aside, there is some evidence of the term Tommy Cooker being used for Crusaders and Valentines as well as the more famous Shermans. It seems that, unlike the German tanks, which could open big doors to let air in, the British tanks were big metal boxes in a desert, and they basically just, with no ventilation, cooked the poor buggers inside. So there you go. Lastly, a half dozen Churchill 3s had arrived in time for El Alamein, where they performed well enough. 
Three and a half inches of armor was nothing to sneeze at. The speed wasn't really any worse than anything else the British had, and the six pounder gun was fairly acceptable in the turret. However, they did not partake in the drive across Libya and were more in theater for a sort of a combat trial. For anti-tank operations, the British had developed porte mounts for the two-pounder, basically craning a full two-pounder system on the back of a truck. And Deacon was the first of the ecclesiastical artillery pieces to show up, this being a six-pounder anti-tank gun, a little turret on the back of an AC Matador truck. At over 12 tons, these were not small or light vehicles, 175 being built, but they were a way of getting an effective six-pounder gun to a fight quickly. Finally, the last member of the British clergy to arrive was Bishop. A modification of the Valentine to mount a 25 pounder artillery piece, the gun had limited elevation and needed to build a ramp to use the full range, but it was a step in the direction of Allied self propelled artillery. So now we have a new arrival to the list of combatants in North Africa, France. Vichy France was going to defend their territory and eventually Free Friends units would also fight on the Allied side. They retained the same collection of tanks, mainly Renault, Otschkis and a few Sommers and D1s, as they had two summers previously. Indeed, so attached were the Sommer crewmen to their tanks that when eventually they would trade them in for Shermans, they took the Sommer nameplates off the S35s and welded them to their M4s. Suffice to say that if one thought the Italians were poorly equipped, one must spare a thought to the French crewmen. And finally, we come to the elephant in the room. Torch sees the arrival of the US Army to combat the European Axis. An interesting note is that the US vehicles were painted with the US flags in the hope that the French would realize that they weren't British and thus not shoot at them. These flags are Union left on both sides of the vehicle as this whole uh, appearing as if it was advancing forward thing wasn't a thing in the army back then. Uh, but I digress. The first combat recipients at US factories were the British, and in addition to the Valentines, the British also introduced the M3 light tank into service. Light is a relative term. At 15 tons, it was three quarters the weight of a Crusader. The ergonomics weren't great. The silhouette was a bit high, but because of the drive shaft and the inch and a half of frontal armor slightly sloped and compared well enough to the cruisers, which are just as riveted, and a 37 mm gun came with a reasonable canister round and a small high explosive round. On the plus side, the Stuart would drive to Doomsday quite quickly, as long as Doomsday was within about 75 miles, because the radial engine tended to drink petrol quickly. There was a diesel engine as well, the British called it Stuart II. Being more or less equivalent to the British cruisers before the six pounder, the British tended to use Stuarts as one. But by the time the Desert War was drawing to a close, other roles started to be found for the vehicle. The Stuart Recce and Stuart Kangaroo both finding themselves without a turret. As a side note, four M2A4 lights were also delivered to the desert, but they were only used for familiarization and training. Some of the later M3 lights came with a stabilizer for the 37mm gun, though I must admit to not having encountered any British writings on their observations. The US also had M3 lights when they landed on Torch as well, complete with the fixed machine guns in the wings, with the, which the British got rid of in short order. The M3A3 was a version with a much better sloped frontal armor, sort of bridging the gap to the M5. The successor M5 was a Cadillac, literally. It had twin Cadillac V8s and an automatic transmission. The thing was incredibly simple to drive, maintain, and it was quiet had the same 37mm gun, bow, pintle, and coaxial machine guns and running gear, but at the time, like the British before them, the US used it as a line tank for combat, not just as a recon vehicle. Some battalions landed in Africa as light tank battalions with no medium tanks at all. This organization would eventually be changed pursuant to lessons learned. On the plus side, however, being before the widespread use of the LST, American medium tanks landing in North Africa needed to use a port. The light tanks could be driven to the shore over pontoons. The medium tank was the M3, with a modified turret with room for a radio in the bustle known as Grant in the British service, and the Lee was the American standard type with a machine gun cupola up top. The, the Americans didn't use those things, by the way. Originally, this was going to be just a stopgap tank, maybe 150 being built pending conversion of the lines to the M4. But the demand from the UK and USSR was such that they couldn't afford to stop production in order to reset the lines for the new tank. 
They arrived in early 1942 and were received with somewhat bridled joy by the British tank establishment. The downsides were obvious. The thing was a monster and the gun was in the wrong place. Mounting the hull, the 75mm had an arc of fire of all of 15 degrees to each side, though it did have a stabilizer like the 37 in the turret. However, the M3 was a product of evolution. Almost all components developed from earlier vehicles down to the 75mm in the hull as demonstrated in the T5E2. That vehicle was a confluence of experiments showing that, to the shock of American enthusiasts, the high explosive round was better than lots and lots of machine guns at dealing with soft targets, and that given what the Panzers were doing to everybody in Poland and France, a better anti-tank capability was required on the tank. That meant the 75mm, though the Americans were reluctant to give up their machine guns. Though Ordnance were apparently happy to build turretless tanks, Infantry Branch insisted upon the inclusion of the turret with the 37mm, presumably to deal with targets to the flanks. In the American turret was a coaxial machine gun and a commander's machine gun. In the hull was two more machine guns, aimed, like the wing guns in the M3 Lite, by the driver. These two were utter wastes of space and almost always removed to make room, yet you will note that every M3 built has the twin machine gun ports in the front left bow, normally with plugs welded in. The 75mm though finally gave the British an excellent tank gun, capable of both dealing with German AFVs and also those irritating anti-tank guns which had been causing the Royal Armoured Corps so much trouble. Better yet, the large hull may have been easier to hit, but it was made of about 5cm of armour sloped to 30 degrees, and just under 4cm sloped at 50 which meant that hitting it and killing it were not necessarily the same thing, especially for Panzer III's or M14's, whilst its 75mm was plenty capable of killing, with a caveat. It turned out that the face-hardened armour of the Panzers did not succumb too easily to the interim US M72 armour-piercing round at ranges over 500 yards, and a programme was started to fit captured German 7.5cm AP projectiles to US cartridges. However, by the time this conversion of about 15,000 rounds was done in May, the US had started shipping the better M61 APC round, which also proved lethal to Panzers at a kilometre. So it had a good gun, if a little bit awkward to get into place, and reasonable armour. The best bit though, was that it ran. Possibly because they had more time to work out the bugs, or maybe the realisation that anything the US built would have to be used and maintained at the end of an extremely long supply line. US design and acceptance criteria were arguably the most conservative and strict of any nation. It meant that sometimes vehicles might not have the biggest gun, fastest engine, most armour, or whatever, but it did mean you could get the absolute best out of it, and given that, with the exception of Valentine, the British armoured force had been using reliability disaster after reliability disaster, the reliability of Grant came as a glorious gift from the heavens. As David Fletcher put it, the tank, which had been so unpopular with the experts in the UK when it was first offered, proved to be a great success in service. When the US 1st Armoured Division landed in Torch, they still had M3 mediums, as the M4s were diverted to the UK for their use at El Alamein. Although replacement tanks delivered were all M4s, at least one independent tank battalion, the 751st, had M3 mediums all the way through the end of the campaign. So then we come to Sherman, the M4 medium. When they first showed up to fight with the British Del Alamein, they were arguably the best tanks in the world. With 5 centimeters of armour sloped to 56 degrees, or 76mm at 30 on the turret, they were the best protected tanks on the field. The 75mm gun with stabiliser was capable against all targets encountered, the turret would spin a full circle in only 15 seconds, and the running gear and powertrain was by now virtually bulletproof the 350 horsepower motor hauling the vehicle along at a top speed of 40 km an hour, at reliability rates which astonished British tankers. However, they were still not perfect. There was no loader's hatch on these tanks, there was no commander's cupola, vision being limited to rotating periscopes, and the linkage to the gunner's sight was unreliable, requiring a modification kit being sent out to include a coaxial telescope. For the torch landing, the units arriving straight from the US were originally supposed to come equipped with 76mm guns on M4s to better deal with any heavier enemy armour which might appear, but the tanks did not pass testing, mainly for ergonomic reasons. 
As the 75mm was doing well enough against what the Germans and Italians were fielding so far, there seemed little time pressure, and the order for 1,000 76mm tanks was cancelled, pending a more acceptable mounting that a crew could get the most out of. Speaking of tank killing, the Americans had been taking note of the German propaganda reels from France, showing tanks supported by Stukas as the dominant unstoppable force. And they had a sit down and a bit of a think about the problem. They concluded that they needed a highly mobile unit capable of efficiently killing tanks which were breaking through, and also capable of protecting themselves from aircraft. Enter the Tank Destroyer Battalion. Making a vehicle which met all the requirements was proving a little bit difficult, so in the meantime interim vehicles were fielded. A tank destroyer battalion had light and heavy guns. The light gun was the M6 gun motor carriage, basically a 37mm anti-tank gun with a small shield on the back of a dodged 3 quarter ton truck. The thing was pretty much useless the day it arrived in Africa, except maybe as something for the enemy to shoot at instead of more dangerous targets. Those would be the heavy guns on M3 gun motor carriages. Equipped with the M1897 A4, yes, a variation on the 19th century French 75, this manually operated gun was mounted on the back of half tracks. However, the 75mm was quite simply the biggest thing that the Americans could put acceptably onto a vehicle. Trials with vehicles with 3 inch guns were not passing. Still, less than ideal though the M3 was, they still did prove dangerous. Their replacements would not be long in coming. By early 1943, a derivative of the M4A2 arrived, the M10. The twin diesels in the back were a bit of an oddity in the US Army, which preferred to keep all the gasoline, but the 3 inch gun was lethal to anything in Africa. Even a Tiger could fall to one, if the TD crew could ever beat the odds and actually find one to shoot at. In keeping with the tank destroyer philosophy of being faster than a tank and also being open topped in order to see the enemy first, Armour was reduced to only 1.5 inches, and no coaxial or hull machine guns took up space or weight. The other odd feature of the tank destroyer units was that they originally were to come with heavy anti-aircraft complements. Each four-gun platoon was supposed to be accompanied by a section of two 37mm anti-aircraft guns to deal with those nasty Stukas, and also with a secondary anti-armour capability. This seems to be one of those rare instances, though, of the US fielding understrength organizations, as the only self propelled 37mm mount at the time was the T 28E1 multiple gun motor carriage. Somewhere just over 70 were in theater, a 37mm and twin caliber 50 on a half track, but assigned to the 443rd AA Battalion, there's no indication that they were ever dispatched to TD units. Eventually, the related M15 multiple gun motor carriage would be sent to North Africa, but by that point it was realized that Axis Air Forces weren't such of a problem anymore, and the AA gun authorization was removed from the tank destroyer units. All the M10s came with a caliber 50 anyway, which would send a sufficiently distracting amount of tracer at any enemy aircraft. Indeed, that was the purpose of the .50 on basically anything that the Americans could put it on, including the M4s. The last of the notable Sherman variants to see service in North Africa was the M7 Howitzer motor carriage, uh, known far and wide as Priest. This gave both the British and Americans a rapidly mobile 105mm howitzer which did not need time to limber or unlimber, could change orientation quickly. It carried 69 rounds, able to range some 12,000 yards, uh, but often could be seen towing a trailer with more ammo. It was another of the second El Alamein debutantes. So there you go. Obviously, with so many combatants, it is impossible to go into heavier details. If any of these comments have piqued your interest, I encourage you to undertake some further digging. I personally cover a number of these vehicles and organizations on my own channel. Hope you found it all interesting and informative. Take care. And that is a wrap. The British situation is pretty varied with some solid design and manufacturing, some complicated issues in reliability and performance, and some just straight up weird ideas. And you really should go look up that Rota trailer Chieftain mentions, right? And like the Tiger in part one, we are also introduced to another iconic tank, the Sherman. We will see, likely, I can't see the future, but we'll likely see many more Sherman tanks 
throughout the course of what remains of the war. Okay, all that remains now is to once again thank Chieftain for doing these specials for us, so thank you, Chieftain. He is an expert in every sense of the word. He's actually a really nice guy, too, which is a, which is a bonus. And I'll remind you once again to subscribe to his channel if you have not already done so, and subscribe to my channel if you have not already done so. That is all. See you next time. <laughs>